ओम ज्ञान थे मृदस्य ज्ञानांजन शलाका तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः थैंक यू हरे कृष्णा सो so, कर्मणो यपि बोद्धव्यम बोद्धव्यम च विकर्मणः अकर्मणश्च बोद्धव्यम गहना कर्मणो गति ही सो कृष्णा इज स्पीकिंग हियर अबाउट द कांसेप्ट ऑफ कर्मा दैट गहना कर्मणो गति ही that the movements of karma are very difficult to understand and therefore arjuna try to understand what is karma what is akarma and what is vikarma so today we will discuss two things what is karma and why do bad things happen to good people why do bad things happen to good people is something we have briefly discussed earlier in 247 about destiny and we'll go a little deeper into that but the main focus will be on the concept of karma now in the powerpoint that you have with you we look at firstly what is the meaning of the word karma the word karma can have four distinct meanings this is slide 4 slide 4 is that <clears throat> so kim kar uh, so we'll be discussing 4 16 and 17 18 those four three verses we'll be discussing and we'll be focusing on the idea that understanding karma krishna says kim karma kim karmeti kavayo apyatra mohitah that what is karma what is what karma that is very difficult to understand so now the word karma can have four distinct meanings one is first is it refers to the action that we do second is it refers to the reaction that we get for our actions third is that it refers to the system of action reaction so fourth is a particular kind of action let me explain these four meanings at a basic level <clears throat> karma refers to what is it that we are going to do our actions that we have to everyone when krishna says karmannevadhikaraste in the bhagavad gita that you have a right to do your work karma literally means work karma yoga or karma yogi when people identify themselves as such saying one who those who do work so karma means work karma means action interestingly karma also means reaction so we all have to suffer our own karma so sometimes we may use the word the reactions of our karma but sometimes we short hand and say that you know it's my own karma coming back to me it means my karma coming back to me as the reactions or sometimes people say it must be in my karma now in my karma what does it mean if karma is only the actions that we do well karma is not just the actions that we do it is also the reactions that we get so karma can refer to the reactions we get and then karma can also refer to the system of action reaction wherein we understand that actually each one of us uh is under the law of karma so we may say the law the principle of karma or the law of karma is infallible inexorable that means that no matter what we do we may be clever or sneaky enough to escape the law of karma the law of the land but nobody can escape the law of karma so that is <clears throat> the system of karma karmana daiva netrena jantor deho papattaye karmana daiva netrena as per the karma uh, the daiva that we have created and we all under the divine vision we all get the results karmana daiva netrena so now moving on Uh, that the fourth word fourth sense is that there are three different kinds of karma there is karma vikarma and akarma so within that karma is one kind of karma the word karma means it can another word for it is sukarma sukarma means that good work so prescribed work or work that is a work that is virtuous work that will give us good results so that is sukarma so karma and then vi karma vi karma is rudd viruddha rupena karma that which is the opposite of what we are meant to do so we could say immoral harmful 
a destructive anti scriptural work that is vikarma and then a karma uh, in this context refers to a work that will not produce any reaction i'll come to that a little later but let's focus on these two points right now that the word karma the word karma has multiple definitions and when we understand these multiple definitions we can understand that actually when we refer to karma we we instinctively gravitate toward a particular meaning and what that meaning is it may not be very it may not always be the accurate meaning in language in general words often have multiple meanings and sometimes some words can have even opposite meanings they are called contronyms contronyms are words where there, there are two meanings and the two meanings are not just different but opposite for example consider the word discrimination in english now discrimination at one level has a very negative connotation there should not be any gender discrimination race, race racial discrimination or any that kind of discrimination but the same another sense the discrimination is also uh, is also a positive word where uh, the capacity to make necessary and valid distinctions so for example somebody is a he's a discriminating art critic discriminating means that a person understands okay <clears throat> the person knows what is the what is good art what is poor art and then they can make a so discrimination in that sense means discriminating ability that means the like ability to understand this is this is good this is bad this is right this is wrong now what scale one body is using for good and bad that may vary but just as the words can have not just different but opposite meanings so same way when we use the word karma what is the meaning that is being considered is is something which we need to carefully understand so now normally when we have our discussions we may have different meanings of the same word being used in different contexts but based on the context we understand immediately okay this is the meaning you are using for this now consider in english the word run is supposed to have the largest number of meanings now the car, the computer the car is not running or the water pump is water tap is not water tap is not running he is going to run for the elections he does not run fast enough to ever participate in athletic competition now here we see the word run is being used with different meanings but immediately we understand which meaning is being used now when we come to scripture because it's in a language that we don't normally converse in so we often don't get a sense of the context now when the bhagavad gita so bhagavad gita when it uses the word karma in what context is it using it we need to care, uh, look at it so <clears throat> when krishna is telling arjuna that let's look at the fourth slide now that is fifth slide rather the gita on karma uh, what as the sense in which the gita uses the word karma it primarily uses it in the first sense sometimes in the fourth sense for so karmanne vadhikaraste karmanne vadhikaraste that means you have a right to do your work here krishna is using the word karma in the in the right course of action in the sense of the right course of action so that means that you you have a right to do your duty karma refers in that sense to the responsible right thing to do now if you look at this context and look at the word kim karma kim akarmeti kavayo apya atra mohitaha what is action and what is inaction even the wise people are bewildered about this tatte karma pravakshami yad gyantva moksha se ashubhat krishna said now i'll explain that concept of karma to you and knowing this krishna says there is a big result that is you will become free from inauspiciousness you will know which course of action to follow by which you can avoid getting trapped you can avoid getting bound so now what is krishna actually saying over here when he is saying if we take a literal meaning of the word karma and akarma here as karma as the right course of action 
a karma as action and a karma as inaction. Now, even a child can tell whether somebody is doing activity or somebody is being inactive. If a child wants to do some mischief, the child will look maybe the father or the mother, they are sitting on a chair, their eyes are closed, they will not notice me. They will not notice, so then the child may do some mischief. So, even a child can understand whether somebody is active or inactive. So, if a child can understand, then why will the wise be bewildered? So, the literal meaning does not make any sense over here. That Our literal meaning or the first meaning. First meaning of karma is action and our karma is inaction. So, if you take that meaning, it, the whole idea becomes meaningless. Why would wise people be bewildered? But what it means over here is, Kim karma kim akarmeti. What is the right course of action? Or what is the action that will, what, what is action and what is inaction? So what is the action that will lead to reaction and what is the action that will not lead to reaction? A karma here refers to the action that doesn't lead to reaction. Let's look at the next meaning of the word a karma. So a karma is the opposite of karma. So it can refer to action and no action. But a karma can also refer to action that does not produce any reaction. Action that does not produce any reaction. Now why is that a major concern for Arjuna at this stage in the war? Because in the first chapter Arjuna has said that I will be papa mevashtai dasman hatvaita natataina tasman narha vayamhanto so he says that how can I attack or kill my own relatives? If I do that, I'll be ruined by that. I'll be ruined. So I cannot do this. So therefore, what is he saying? He's saying that uh, that uh, he wants to know what is the right course of action. What is it that he should do? So he doesn't want to get entangled by doing wrong actions because then he will get wrong reaction. The reactions to the wrong actions which will keep him bound. So a major concern of the Bhagavad Gita is to act in a way that does not entangle one. So when Krishna is telling Arjuna, Kim karma kim akarmeti, which action will entangle and which action will not entangle. So karma here refers to entangling action. And a karma refers to action that won't entangle. So a karma is action that is non-reactive or non-entangling. So Arjuna wants to know what will be a karma. What is it that I should do by which I will not be bound. And Krishna is saying don't think it's that simple. Arjuna at first level thinks that oh if I fight I will kill. And if I kill obviously I am doing terrible karma. And there will be reaction for that. So if I don't fight, if I don't kill then there will be no reaction. And that way I will not be bound. So Arjuna is going this, going with the, to some extent with the literal meaning of the words. He's thinking that fighting will be entangling, not fighting will be non-entangling. But Krishna is saying that this is not that simple. Kavayo pyatra mohitaha. What is the right thing to do and what is not the right thing to do? That is, even the wise people are bewildered about this. So why are they bewildered? Because, you know, what determines whether we get a reaction to our action, it to an action is not the action itself but the intention behind that action. But intention behind that action. Let's look at the next two, the two verses later, 418. This is one of the most confusing verses in the Gita. If you look at it again from a literal perspective, Karmanya Karmaiha Pashed Akarmani Chakarmayaha Sabuddhiman Manusheshu Sayuktaha Krishna Karma Krat. So he's saying over here, karmanya akarma yaha pashed. Karmanya, in, in the performance of action, akarma yaha pashed. One who sees that there is actually no action being performed. That means there is, in the performance of action, when one sees that there is no action that will produce reaction, and akarmani cha karma yaha, and in the non-performance of action, there is, actually a reaction going to come by not do, even by doing something sometimes we may not get reactions and even by not doing something we may get reactions and one who can pursue this sabuddhiman manusheshu 
Krishna says, one who can see like this is buddhiman, is a wise person. Sayuktaha Krishna karma krit, sayuktaha. As a person is well situated, well engaged, well connected. Yuktaha is a variant from the word yoga. Yoga is to the process that connects and yuktaha is one who is connected. That person is well connected, so connected or engaged. So yuktaha, krutsna karma krut. And that person can do all kinds of work and still that person will be spiritually connected. So Krishna is telling Arjuna that uh, akarmanya karma yaha pashyed. And karma, each akarma yaha. One, one result of knowledge. Such a person is buddhiman, Krishna says. is knowledgeable, is wise intelligent. So, one characteristic of intelligence, expertise, knowledge, is that one can see beyond appearances. That means, now there is this <clears throat> big threat of the coronavirus all over the world. A person who doesn't know about the threat of the coronavirus, even they some, see somebody sneezing or coughing, say, okay, it's just ordinary cough. But somebody who has knowledge, they may consider, oh, is this, is this because of that infection? Do I need to keep a big distance from this person? Do this person need to be checked? So the more knowledge we have, the more, the more we can see things. Now, we can understand this very easily. It's like in a stock market, if uh, say a, a person who is uh, from a remote tribe and who has no idea of how the finances work, uh, modern financial industry, fin modern finances work. He comes to a stock market and he sees people, hundreds of people sitting in front of, staring at a giant screen. And on that screen, a line goes down. A line just crashes down. And everybody catches their head. Oh no! And he starts thinking, oh, what happened? You know, just one line went down on a screen. Why are you so worked up? Well, it's, to the uninformed eye, it is just one line going down. But to the knowledgeable eye, to the informed eye, there is a lot that has happened. People may have lost millions of dollars because of that. So we don't just see with our eyes. We see with the knowledge that helps us make sense of what our eyes see. So basically, one understanding of the, of knowledge, one, uh, with the, of uh, knowledgeable vision, Krishna will later talk about this as the Jnana Chakshu. The eyes of knowledge. So, one result of seeing with knowledge is that can, we can see deeper than what ordinary people can see. But in this case, with the eyes of knowledge, Krishna is saying you will not only see deeper than what most people see, but you can see the opposite of what is seen with the, uh, uh, with the simple eye with the unaided eye. So, for example, some people might uh, appear very confident, but uh, it might be that they have a lot of bluff and bravado and be beneath that they are very insecure and they have extremely low self-esteem. So, they have a big swagger to them when they walk, but internally they are very insecure. So, if we know them well, or if we are good at reading people, then we understand that, oh, this person is actually very insecure. In fact, the people who are, who have the least respect for themselves are often most agitated when others don't respect them. So when we know the person or we know psychology, human psychology, then we can see that, oh, this swagger doesn't indicate confidence. Actually, this swagger is a cover up for lack of confidence. So knowledge helps us to see the reality to be the opposite of what it seems to be. Or, some people are humble and unassuming. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are unqualified or <clears throat> diffident. But, you know, they might just be small in stature, they might have a small voice, they might have a very soft voice, they might have a very gentle expression. You think, oh, this is a nice person. But then, when they start speaking, and they speak, they speak, uh, eloquently, they speak strongly and then, oh, this person has a lot of power within them. So, what happens is that appearances can not, appearances can be deceptive completely. 
So Krishna is saying similarly that what seems entangling may actually not be entangling and what may seem, may seem to be non-entangling may be entangling. So you should see properly what actually is or, or what actually is the action that entangles and what is the action that doesn't entangle and based on that you act properly. So why is this whole concept of karma being discussed in the Bhagavad Gita right now? Because as Arjuna had to decide uh, what is the right course of action for me to do. Should I fight the war or should I not fight the war? And in this particular section, previously we discussed how Krishna uh, has descended to this world, Krishna has given spiritual knowledge and Krishna has created various paths to access him. So, 4, 1, 2, 3, you talk about how he has descended, created a system of parampara. 4, 8, 7, 8 talks about how he descends to establish dharma. And then 4, 11 talks about yathamam prapadinti, how there are different paths by which people can come to him. So, now, what does this mean that our past karma, so we have, so in from the past section of the Gita, Krishna has said that he has, he has provided us path to rise to him. And that is true, that is what scripture used. But still it is we who have to take scripture as a guidebook and then make our decisions about how to act. So Krishna is telling him that you have to learn to act responsibly. So now coming back to this 418, I have given some, go to slide 8 now, of how we understand these two verses, uh, the, or these two parts of the verse. Karmanya akarma iha pashed. That means even when you do action, you don't see see that there is no reaction to that action. So the example I have given in slide 9. If a soldier is fighting a war on behalf of the country, and the soldier may kill many or enemy soldiers. And normally killing a human being kill, killing a human being is heinous. But on a war field, if the soldier kills, the soldier might at the end receive a bravery award from the state. But as soon as the same soldier comes back to his home and then gets angry with the neighbor and shoots the neighbor, will be punished. So, in when the soldier is fighting on behalf of the nation, then there is no, there is no immediate selfish intention over there. And that's why there is no reaction. But other times, there is a serious reaction. If we consider the other side of it, that is, karmanya akarmaya pashet akarmani cha karmaya. If some riots are going on and the police remain silent at that time, if the police remain silent, then what is going to happen? Then it is they who are going to be culpable. They are going to be responsible for the consequences of their actions. That we may say they didn't do any action. That's fine. They didn't do any action, but not doing action itself is culpable. They are meant to act over there. They are meant to, police is meant to protect the innocent. So if rioters are rioting and uh, destroying property and wounding or killing people, the police have to act at that time. So therefore, what happens is that there is, inaction can also lead to serious reaction. If a doctor knows that a particular patient is sick and the doctor has to give the medication, but doctor fails to or neglects to give the medication, then there is a crime by, there is a neglect, there is a crime, and is criminal by neglect. So that is, Arjuna, Krishna is telling Arjuna that in your particular case, you are a Kshatriya, you are a warrior, and you have a duty to fight. And if you do not fight, then you will be culpable. You will be culpable and therefore, whatever happens Arjuna, take responsibility and fight. So, that's what Krishna is telling Arjuna over here in the context of this particular verse. So now, let's move on to the second part. This is, now, so karma we discussed in terms of primarily the actions that we do right now. So, now, uh, how to choose the right course of action was the discussion of karma but generally when we talk about karma there is this question that comes up why do bad things happen to good people now that's an elaborate philosophical subject and 
Krishna himself acknowledges Gahana Karmanogati. Gahana Karmanogati means it's difficult to understand. So now the idea in karma is that each of us have had many lives in the past and every action that we do is like a seed sowing action. And when the seed is sown, the the fruit is going to come from it. And when the fruit comes, we will have to we will have to eat that fruit. There is no uh, no alternative to that. I say that the kitchen version of the law of karma would be that whatever we cook, we will have to eat. So if we cook badly, then it is we who will have to eat the bad food. It's not that oh this food tastes bad. I don't know. I just throw it away. We can't throw it away. Whatever we cook, we will have to eat it. And essentially, it is not just the reactions that we are getting sooner or later. Actually, we are by our actions, by our thoughts, by our by our intentions, we are we are cooking our consciousness. And if our consciousness is cooked in such a way that it is it is filled with uh, craving and resentment and despair and irritation and negativity and envy then that is the consciousness that we have to live with. So if we cook the consciousness and we eat it, then we stay dissatisfied, irritated. So if we cultivate those, if we do the actions that feed those emotions, then that's what we have to live with. So if somebody engages in sensual activities repeatedly, indiscriminately, then the sensual craving drives and drags them repeatedly, torments them constantly. And then... That's how we suffer. So, so that person is tormented internally, constantly dissatisfied, constantly irritated. So for each one of us, we have to live. So karma has two consequences. One is the external in terms of whatever results we get based on the actions that uh, we have got. But that is external level. But internally, it affects our consciousness. So now, as far as the external results are concerned, these different results may come at different times. And that's why we cannot just simplistically say that karma is the answer to when anybody is suffering, it's because of their karma. Karma is not a pat answer to the problem of evil. The problem of evil is essentially, why do bad things happen to good people? And uh, it is, this is a difficult question. It has no easy answers. And Krishna himself doesn't say Gahano Gahana Karma Gahano Karmanagati. So we cannot claim that something is very simple and straightforward, and Krishna himself is saying that it is difficult. So why is it difficult that if there are if somebody has done bad, they will get bad results, somebody has done good, they will get good results. At one level, we understand we all operate with an implicit acceptance of the principle of karma. Nobody can live without some understanding of cause and effect. If we if we expose ourselves to cold weather, then we get cold. If say if you have a child, the child comes back home with a with a broken nose and a black eye, what happened? What did you do? Parents would be horrified, alarmed. Say, oh, nothing, nothing. Actually, I just bumped into a wall. That is obviously not true. When we see an effect, we understand there has to be a cause. And similarly, whenever there is a cause, there will be an effect. So the principle of karma becomes complicated because different seeds fructify after different durations. And that's why it may be that somebody has done something, uh, somebody is doing something good right now, but something bad which they have done in the past that is fructifying right now. And because of that, they are seeming to do good, but a bad result is coming upon them. To understand this, let's look at the... So, let's look at slide third. So, that's why whenever somebody is suffering, the focus should not be on the karma of the victim, but on the dharma of the relief giver. What does that mean? That means, say, now, for example, so many people are sick. Now, is it that everybody who is sick because of the because of the infection of the coronavirus is that everybody is suffering because of their own karma? We don't know. It is what is the dharma of the relief giver? The dharma of the relief giver is 
that we should provide, if we have the resources, we provide relief. We see that in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the fourth canto, there is a great natural catastrophe where Maharaj Pruthu is ruling and all the supplies on the earth dry up. And the citizens come and beg to Pruthu Maharaj, to King Pruthu that, we have nothing to eat. The digestive firing fire is burning our bod- bellies and bodies from inside like a small log of wood being burned from both sides by fire. And then Prutu Maharaj doesn't say over there, oh, it's all your karma because of which you are suffering. No, he takes action. He says, I am a king. It is my dharma to provide for the citizens. And therefore, he takes responsibility for that. He takes responsibility means he pursues the earth and he prevails on her to end her ways, to to change her ways and provide. And there is an elaborate description of how the earth provides the various necessities for various living beings. We won't go into specifics, but the important point is that when some anybody is in distress, uh, the principle of karma is primarily used not for, for for It is used primarily for judging or for deciding our own actions. It is not used for judging people's pasts. I will repeat this. It is used primarily for judging what we should or should not do. It is not to be used for judging what people have done or not done in the past. Why not? Because the, the past is complicated and we have to we have to see people from how they are in this life's perspective if we start simplistically saying that oh everything that is happening is if somebody is suffering it's because of their past karma then the result of that would be if you can, we could become very hard hearted say if a small baby is crying should the mother think oh the baby is crying because of past karma no the mother has to think what is my dharma My dharma is to take care of the baby. Therefore, let me do what I can. And sometimes, despite the best care provided by the parent, despite the best care provided by the medical staff, sometimes the baby might have some pain or some disease which is not easily curable. And at at that time, the baby might just cry. So, what can be done at that time? Well, that time nothing can be done. One has to accept it. Okay, that is, we may accept it as destiny. But it is, the focus has to be on what can I do? If I am the position position of a relief giver, what can I do? So, if you go to slide 13 now, we can see that the problem of evil or the cause of suffering, there can be multiple levels of causes for it. There is an immediate cause, there is a remote cause and there is an ultimate cause. So, if we consider now, this is from left to right. So the first is the immediate cause. So consider now there is an infection. Now people are getting infected by the virus. <clears throat> so now, if somebody falls sick, what is the cause of the sickness? Yes, they are infected by the virus. But that is not the only cause. Sometimes the same person, and two people might be in the same family, and both of them might get infected, but one of them becomes very sick, the other doesn't become so sick. They might say, no, no, some people have less immunity, some people have more immunity. Well, that is true to some extent, but it's not always true. I know uh, I know a friend who had a heart disease and the doctor told him that you may not live for more than 2-3 years. And this, this friend is alive after 20 years now and his doctor died almost 15 years ago because of a heart disease, heart failure. So now, uh, from the perspective, this, from the overall perspective, the doctor had no history of heart problems. And this, this friend had a lot of history, a lot of heart problems, but he lived and the other person died. So the point is, there is an immediate cause and the immediate cause has to be considered. But the immediate cause is not the complete cause. So, there is the immediate cause and then there is the remote cause. So, the remote cause is one's past karma. Now, what does it mean, one's past karma? Like, if we consider, say, somebody gets malaria, 
That's usually because they've been bitten by a mosquito. But in the same house, there might be five people who might be living. All five are bitten by a mosquito. But only one of them get malaria. Again, we might say that's immunity or whatever. But sometimes we might find that somebody with a low immunity doesn't get the disease and somebody with a high immunity gets the disease. So in med- medical science is remarkably sophisticated. We know far, far more than what we knew a few hundred years ago. And still, even within medical science, there are medical mysteries or medical miracles. Why sometimes the same medicine works for some people, doesn't work for some people? Why some people who who are healthy die suddenly, some people who are supposed to die live on for many years? There are exceptions. So now, this is not to deny the mainstream of scientific knowledge, mainstream of medical knowledge. We accept the mainstream knowledge, but we also look at the extremities. The knowledge always advances by looking at the extremities, at the threshold conditions when the knowledge doesn't seem to work so well. Where the knowledge works, of course we use it, but where it doesn't work, that is the way, that is the area where we can expand our knowledge, expand our understanding. In the history of physics, Newtonian physics worked wonderfully for the objects that we could observe or measure at the anthropic level of perception, at the human level of perception. And Newtonian physics became the bedrock of physics. But as humanity developed more and more sophisticated instruments and it started delving into the microscopic level as well as the macroscopic level, then we found that at those two threshold conditions, the Newtonian physics didn't work. And that's how we came up, physics came up with quantum physics. And then we also came up with, uh, for large bodies, Einstein came up with um, relativity. So the idea is that the immediate cause is obviously a cause. But there are cases when the immediate cause is not the complete cause. And then we look deeper. So the remote cause is one's own past karma. And the ultimate cause is disconnection from Krishna. Is our spiritual forgetfulness, our spiritual amnesia. Because of which we have forgotten who we are and what we are meant to do. And that's why we are suffering. So now in different situations, we address problems at different levels. So now why do bad things happen to good people? Because they might be good right now and the immediate cause might not be much. But the remote cause might be very big. So it's like in some situations, the immediate cause may be 0.1% and the remote cause may be 99.9%. So somebody just... uh, they are following all possible, all precautions, say to avoid infection, but somehow maybe they are traveling in a fly a plane or a train or somewhere, they're, they're sleeping and they wake up and they're tired and they touch something and they touch their face and they get an infection. Now they normally, in the wakeful state, they are awake and they don't make any mistakes. But at that time, when that happens, it was a mistake on their part, but it was a mi- very minor mistake. So what happens over here is that sometimes our par- par- so they are a good person but they are good in terms of right now they are doing nothing wrong but they have some bad karma from the past. On the other hand somebody might live quite recklessly but nothing might happen to them. So sometimes the uh, the present actions might be 99% and the previous might be just 1%. So this percentage can vary from situation to situation. And that's why, now if you go to the next slide, slide 14, that there is the cause of suffering, when we have to understand, one extreme is to see only the immediate cause, the other extreme is to see only the remote cause. That means, whatever is happening, we just say, okay, this is the cause and that's all there is to it. Well, that's that's okay, but the immediate cause is not the complete cause. And if you look only at the, so if you look at the immediate cause only, we become short-sighted. If you look at the remote cause only, we become hard-hearted. Hard-hearted. We just don't consider that people are suffering and from this life's perspective, it appears to be extremely unfair. And we need to acknowledge that they could be victims from this life's perspective and they have to be uh, appropriately taken care of. So we don't want to be short sighted, we don't want to be short sighted, we don't want to be hard hearted. We need to have a balanced perspective. 
and that balance perspective is where we learn to take action appropriately based on a holistic understanding of situations sometimes there is the immediate cause which has to be addressed and sometimes the remote cause understanding the remote cause i can't do much about it we accept it and we live with it so the next slide is in it a whole class in itself and i will talk about this in more detail in the future session but i'll just quickly mention this based on this understanding of immediate and remote causes you can say that there are broadly three options for us when we are going through difficulties tolerate mitigate or immigrate oh it is not mm, immigrate that means if there is some situation that is very difficult we just learn to live with it i can't do much about it so when the remote cause is what is prominently doing something and there's nothing we can do about changing it then we have to learn to tolerate it suppose somebody is uh, living in a place where the weather is terrible and there's very little they can do about it they just have to live with that weather so but if it is primarily the immediate cause that is causing something then we have to mitigate okay so if there is a say now if the the coronavirus infection is spreading and we have to be shut we have to restrain our activity substantially then we have to accept that but within that if we find that the government or some some careless or unscrupulous agents are are spreading the disease then whoever is in position of authority has to act to correct that that's mitigate and then there is immigrate immigrate is where one has to oh this is not a situation i can be best in i just have to leave i have to move out of here so we could say that when it's with respect to remote cause we tolerate with respect to immediate cause we mitigate and with respect to ultimate cause that is disconnection from krishna we immigrate we immigrate we move out of material consciousness to spiritual consciousness ultimately we move out of this material world and attain the spiritual world and in this way we all can have different courses of action that we use in different situations by understanding so when krishna says in this band uh, by understanding the principle of karma that's why if we go back to the start of the verse to the starting verse rather that kim karma kim abarmeti kavayo pyatra mohita tatte karma pravakshami yajnatva moksha se ashubhat if you understand this then moksha se ashubhat you will become free from inauspiciousness inauspiciousness means that we will stop doing the things that unnecessarily aggravate and complicate our situations and we will gradually elevate and liberate ourselves so whether we have to tolerate whether we have to mitigate or whether we have to immigrate fundamentally we need to appreciate we need to appreciate that in every situation every situation is an opportunity for our spiritual growth every situation is uh, an opportunity by which we can grow in self understanding every situation is an opportunity for which you can go closer to krishna and that understanding and keep us positive even when life seems to be confusing or life seems to flood us with negativities the so the scripture doesn't focus so the bhagavad gita doesn't really go about uh, establishing or proving the law of karma it just accepts it as a given truth and the gita's focus is on not on why bad things happen to good people but on when bad, when bad things happen to good people what do good people do so krishna tells arjuna that bahavo gyana tapasa puta mad bhav magata many in the past have acted wisely and become liberated he says this in 410 and he also says the similar point in 415 and krishna urges arjuna to also act similarly responsibly i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the topic of what is karma and why do bad things happen to good people so with respect to that we talked about four understandings of the word karma one is that karma refers to the action that we do the re- second is the reaction we get third is the system of action the reaction and fourth is a particular type of action a good action which will lead to a good reaction so now then i talked about 
A karma can also mean two things. Okay, it can mean no action or it can mean action that gives no reaction. And then I talked about the Bhagavad Gita talks about karma primarily in the sense of which action should we do? Not so much about what reaction we will get. Because Arjuna's primary dilemma is what, what is the right thing for me to do in this situation? Should I fight or should I not fight? And Krishna says that that kim karma kim akarmeti kavyo pyatra mohitaha what is action, what is inaction is very difficult for even for the wise to understand. So here clearly Krishna is not using the word in the literal sense. That what is action and what is inaction, even a child can perceive that. So then we discussed what is knowledge enables us, expands our vision, so or deepens our vision so that we can see beyond the immediate. Now sometimes the knowledgeable vision sees more than what is visible and sometimes the knowledgeable vision sees that the reality is the opposite of what is visible. So a person who is, has a lot of bluster might lack in confidence and a person who is unassuming might have great strength. So karmanya karmaya pashet akarmani cha karmaya. So Krishna says that Arjuna, even if you act responsibly to fight but with, with a mood of dutiful detachment, then you will not be entangled. It's like a, warrior, a soldier fighting on behalf of the country. On the other hand, even if you don't act, if you don't act, you may get entangled. Akarmani cha karmayaha. Why? Because you will be like a uh, like a law enforcement officer who doesn't who stays silent while uh, while the law is being violated, while criminals, rioters are doing terrible things. So therefore, uh, understand properly what is action and what is inaction. What is the action that will not lead to the entanglement and what is the action that will lead to entanglement and then act accordingly. And then you talk about, about why do bad things happen to good people and in that context we discussed about firstly the principle of karma is not is something which we all understand. There is cause effect correlation and this cause effect correlation can extend before this life and beyond this life. Because each action is like a seed that we sow and different seeds fructify after different time durations. Simultaneously, <clears throat> when we are dealing with people, we use the knowledge of karma primarily to decide what is the right thing for us to do, not to judge people and their past. So, we should focus on what is our dharma, not what, an, what is other people's past karma. And then I talked about Lastly, that when we go through difficulties, we talk about a pendulum, that there is an Im immediate cause, there is a remote cause, there is an ultimate cause. So the immediate cause is the, the uh, say in the case of this corona scare that is there, the immediate cause is that they are, uh, they get in, they are in touch with somebody who's, uh, who has been infected. The remote cause is their own karma and the ultimate cause is disconnection from Krishna. And then we, when we face a difficulty, we address it at the appropriate level. So at the level of immediate karma, at the immediate level, we mitigate as much as we can. At the level of remote, if it's primarily remote, uh, the remote cause is what is acting right now, then we tolerate it. And if it's the ultimate cause, we immigrate by raising ourselves to spiritual consciousness. Most fundamentally, rather than resenting the situation, the suffering, we appreciate it as an opportunity for spiritual growth. Rather than, so the Gita doesn't, doesn't explain or justify the principle of karma, the law of karma rather, rather than talking about why do bad things happen to good people, it focuses on urging us to follow the example of that when bad things happen to good people, what do good people do? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So there are a few questions till now. Mm, let's start with the questions that are directly about this session. So, some people may smoke and drink for a long time. They, they smoke lifelong but still they don't get any consequences. Why is that? The idea is that we all have our own past karma. By, say somebody by past karma is meant to have a healthy body. So then even if they abuse their body in this lifetime, their past karma is so much that they may not pass good karma rather is so much that they have that their healthy body remains and whatever they are doing now it will have reactions but maybe not immediately 
it just like so karma is like a bank account the somebody might be uh somebody might be spending very uh, profligately very carelessly right now but if they have a lot of money from their past it might seem that they are not getting any results you know they are not become bankrupt but no matter how much money they have it's going to get over and all the mm-hmm, and all the suf- all the suffering that they have gone all the uh waste that they have made it will have its consequences so that's how we understand that actions do have reactions even if they don't come immediately so actions do have so sometimes some people based on their immediate actions they might not get the reactions immediately but it will come sooner or later and some people don't have a much good karma so that they don't have much of bank balance so even if they have a little bit mistake they do a uh, little bit mistake they do then uh, they, they they spend a little extra money they immediately become bankrupt so like that some people they just smoke a little bit or they take a little drugs and they go they have very nasty, nasty experiences and that's how they uh, they so everybody will have different experiences because what we get in the present is an unpredictable combination of the immediate cause and the remote cause so now so atheists say that atheists use karma as an excuse for their incapability for performing the task that's interesting um if you look at the history of the world some of the biggest accomplishments in history have been done by people who are devoted if you look at the greatest architecture from the past it's usually temples churches mm. they done by people who were devoted if you look at the some of the finest literary compositions from the past they were by people who were devoted so <clears throat> if people were lazy if atheists if theism had made people lazy then how would people do some work like this the mahabharat is 110000 verses if if yasdev had was they who has talked about the principle of karma in the mahabharat quite elaborately if he had used that as a justification for not doing one's duty then uh, why would he have written such a huge book it's 110000 verses is more than is seven times more than any contemporary contemporary means at that time any ancient poem iliad and odyssey combined together and multiplied by 7 is still less than the mahabharat's length so it's stupendous hard work why would they do that if they were using karma as a basis for being um, for not doing their duty so that's a misunderstanding now having said that we have to look at both things you remember the pendulum i talked about how there is the immediate cause and the remote cause so it could be that sometimes some some theists or some people who are devoted they may not even address the immediate cause at all in the name of in the name of uh, karma and that is a mistake even in our tradition in the dharmic tradition there is a the principle of ayurveda and ayurveda doesn't jump to god oh god will protect me from all diseases no ayurveda has it prays to god it is theistic but then it has a whole science of okay this is the disorder in the body and this is the medication that will heal the disorder so there is the immediate cause also that is addressed so if some theists are doing that some then that is a mistake on their part because of misunderstanding or misapplication of the philosophy and actually the capacity to see the past and understand the remote cause may also at work we also at work and to be able to tolerate is a great strength not a weakness because some situation just can't be changed and if we can't tolerate them then we just make things worse in trying to change those things so it is not a weakness it is a strength understanding this and applying it properly so do the three causes of suffering do they act simultaneously <clears throat> well the the ultimate cause is always there because for one thing we are in the material world 
So it's like we are in an ocean and within the ocean sometimes there are stormy waves which come and hit us. So stormy waves are like the difficulties we are having. Sometimes there is smooth sailing, smooth sea. So that's like a comfortable situation we are in. So the fact that we are in the ocean is the cause of our being vulnerable to suffering. The disconnection from Krishna is always acting. Now sometimes, as I said, the remote cause might be just less than 1% and the immediate cause might be 99%. Sometimes the immediate cause might be the, the sometimes it might be the opposite so all three causes are acting and it's not exactly they are simultaneous uh, but one cause might be more prominent at a particular time and in terms of addressing issues one way of addressing might be more effective than others at particular times so is our free will not completely free yes that's true Obviously, you know, every action that we do has its reactions and that means that if, uh, I, if we have acted improperly in the past, then that curtails our free will. Suppose somebody has drunk alcohol repeatedly many, many times in the past and they have become almost like an alcoholic now. Then even if they want to give it up, the past will impel them to drink, drink, drink. So that craving, that goading that is there inside, that will not be there for other people, but for them it will be there in a big way. That's how it is. So yes, our past does curtail our free will, but it doesn't take away our free will completely. It uh, So an alcoholic may have great craving which they can't resist, but in between the cravings they have free will. And they can what they do at that time can shape their fate also, positively rather than negatively. And uh, <clears throat> so... Yeah, the first question is also similar. We have <coughs> why does our deeper knowledge not become visible? Why don't we take the right choice, right action, even when we know it is? That's because of conditioning. But we have to be patient with ourselves. There is a momentum, just like if a car has been is being driven very fast, and then even we press the brake, the car will not stop immediately. So. We may have made some unhealthy choices in the past and now we understand those choices are unhealthy and we don't want to make those choices now. But because of the past actions momentum, we will be pushed toward doing those things repeatedly and we can't say no to them immediately. So what do we do? You know, we at least make sure that we are not pressing the gas and pushing the pushing ourselves in that direction more and more. We do the best we can. Especially as I said, sometimes even if we can't resist the urges, we can persist between the urges. Even if we can't resist the urges, that means when the, when the temptation for the wrong choice comes up and we can't resist it. But in between, what are we doing? In between, if we are trying to connect with Krishna, purify ourselves, build some fences to protect ourselves, then gradually a change will happen. So the more we uh, try to purify ourselves by connecting ourselves with Krishna and the more especially we equip ourselves with something that can keep us spiritually connected then that can protect us that means the say if we find a particular activity in bhakti which is very uplifting for us say we like to recite shlokas we like to hear classes or we like to behold the beautiful deities we like to sing kirtans and keep that activity very easy, very quickly easily accessible to ourselves and whenever that urge comes in rather than saying no to that particular urge, we focus on saying yes to Krishna saying yes to something uplifting and then by that it's much easier to to uh, crowd unwanted desires out of our consciousness than to drive them out to drive them out means to catch physically to catch them and say no 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 get out that's very difficult but to crowd them out means to bring other desires, other thoughts, other stimuli so much into our consciousness that these get crowded out. That's how by the practice of bhakti, the influence of the past conditionings can be countered. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.